distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stomp on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. This is the ninth video in the Inflammation and Immunology section, and this is going to cover the different types of hypersensitivity, type 1, 2, 3, and 4. As is the case with most of this section, we're primarily talking about when the immune system is either too strong or too weak. In our last video, we talked about immunodeficiencies, which is an example of when the immune system is too weak and makes the body susceptible to infection. These next couple videos in the section are going to cover examples of when the immune system is too strong. Hypersensitivity is when an otherwise healthy immune system has an undesirable, exaggerated response to a foreign substance or a perceived foreign substance that damages the body's own cells. These are the same immune processes that are necessary to prevent infection, but they create problems when they're hyperactive or misguided. There are four different types of hypersensitivity, one, two, three, and four, usually represented with a Roman numeral, and keeping the Mechanisms for these four types straight can be a little tricky because the names don't really give you any help. One, two, three, four doesn't tell you what's going on. The way I remember it is my ABCD mnemonic. There's another similar mnemonic that other people use acid, but I like mine better for a couple of reasons. So the mnemonic is one through four is going to correlate to A through D, which makes sense. One A, two B, etc. The A's are going to represent allergic, anaphylaxis, and atopic reactions. B is going to stand for antibody. This is where the mnemonic doesn't make perfect sense, but if you think of the B in antibody, that will help you remember type 2. This is also a bit confusing because antibodies do play some role in more than just type 2 sensitivity. They play a role in type 1 and type 3. However, the classical role of antibody function involving complement activation, NK cell activation, opsonization, those things that you normally think of antibody doing is more a role of type 2 hypersensitivity. Being part of immune complexes, etc., is not usually what first comes to mind with antibody, so that's why the classical roles of antibody are going to be E type 2 hypersensitivity. The immune complexes are going to be C, C for complex, and then D is going to be delayed for type 4. And now we're going to go more into depth into each of these four. We've already mentioned that type 1 hypersensitivity is allergic, anaphylaxis, and atopic reactions. And we're first going to talk about the mechanism of this type of hypersensitivity. You've got an antigen here in purple which is just an innocuous foreign substance, something like dust, pollen, animal dander. And this antigen, regardless of what exact type it is, would not cause a problem in a majority of people. Most people can be around dust and not have a problem. Then you've got preformed membrane-bound IgE here in green on the membrane of mast cells acting as a receptor. Within the mast cells, you've got histamine granules or preformed histamine that's being stored in these granules being ready to be released whenever it's triggered correctly. And you can see here, when the antigen binds to the IgE on the mast cell or basophil, it's going to simultaneously bind more than one IgE. This is called cross-linking, where a single antigen is going to bind to multiple IgEs at the same time. When cross-linking takes place, it triggers the release of mast cell granules that are full of the histamine. Histamine then goes on to signal the various changes associated with the allergies, similar to how it functions during acute inflammation, which we saw in earlier videos in the section. So it's going to cause things like vasodilation and movement of fluid in the periphery, uh, inflammatory cells going out into the body. This allergic reaction, type 1 hypersensitivity, happens almost instantaneously, and the symptoms can become evident within minutes. It happens very quickly. This rapid response is possible because the mast cells are presensitized to the innocuous substance, which means they have preformed membrane-bound IgE that recognizes the particular innocuous antigen. 
So they have pre-made IgE that's designed to recognize that specific antigen, and they've already got this stockpiled histamine. To be pre-sensitized, the immune system must have seen the antigen previously because the IgE formation takes time. So you're not going to have an allergic response like this the first time you see a certain pollen. This is going to be after you've seen it before and you've had some time to develop this specific IgE. Histamine's role in type 1 hypersensitivity is why antihistamines or histamine antagonists like diphenhydramine or loratadine can control some allergic symptoms. Now that we know the mechanism, we'll talk a little bit more about type 1 hypersensitivity, which you can see here in the top right corner. I give a high yield rating of 8, which is a rating scale from 0 to 10 that gives you a rough estimate for how important this topic is for the USMLE Step 1 Medical Board exam. Type 1 hypersensitivity is the most important type that we're going to be talking about. As we've already discussed, it leads to various different allergies. It can be anything from a more mild allergic rhinitis or seasonal allergies that cause things like coughing, sneezing, watery eyes, nasal congestion. It can also cause atopic dermatitis, which is going to cause hives or eczema. This rash is usually red and raised and very itchy or pruritic. Through a similar mechanism, type 1 hypersensitivity can lead to exacerbation of allergic asthma by environmental triggers. Type 1 hypersensitivity is also the mechanism behind more serious allergic reactions, like reactions to peanuts or bee stings that can lead to swelling of the lips, tongue, and throat, shortness of breath, strider, and anaphylactic shock. Anaphylactic shock is a life-threatening condition that results from huge releases of histamine. The histamine is going to cause inflammation and hypotension via global vasodilation, as well as an increase in vascular permeability and significant fluid movement into the tissue and out of the circulation. It is treated with epinephrine, often in the form of an EpiPen when we're talking about patients outside of the medical setting. Epinephrine activates alpha-1 adrenergic receptors to increase contractility of the heart and raise blood pressure via vasoconstriction. Type 2 hypersensitivity is the process by which IgG or IgM binds to a cell to cause injury or death. In other words, antibody-dependent cytotoxicity. This process has the same mechanism of action that normal humoral immunity does, except in this case it's targeted at the body's own cells instead of pathogens. The variable region of the antibody binds to the host cell, while the constant portion interacts with NK cells, complement, and macrophages. It's activating these other immune processes to destroy this cell. Examples of this reaction can be seen in rheumatic fever when the body's own cells look very similar to strep cells and the body ends up accidentally attacking her own cells. Uh, good pasture syndrome where there's anti-glomerular basement membrane antibodies, uh, hemolytic disease of newborns or erythroblastosis fetalis when an RH negative mother has an second RH positive child and the maternal IgG targets the fetal red blood cells. Type 3 hypersensitivity is tissue damage due to immune complexes. Immune complexes are aggregations of antigen and antibody. Usually there are far more antibodies than antigen and this means there's not going to be an issue with immune complexes. However, if there's a large amount of antigen or antigen is not being cleared properly by the immune system, the antigen to antibody ratio increases and we get more similar amounts of antigen and antibody. When the amount of antigen and antibody is comparable, immune complexes can form. In this scenario, a single antibody can simultaneously bind to multiple antigens, which are themselves bound to multiple antibodies and this ends up in a clump of antigens and antibody depositing in tissues, most often in the vessels, the kidney, or the joints. And these 
clumps of antibody still have the ability to activate immune processes like antibody normally would, which means there's going to be inflammation in the tissue and eventual damage of that tissue. Some high yield correlations with type 3 hypersensitivity are going to be lupus, post-strep glomerulonephritis, and rheumatoid arthritis, which are all going to have components of the disease process due to immune complexes. Type 4 hypersensitivity is referred to as delayed hypersensitivity because it takes a few days to kick in. It involves Th1 T cells attracting and activating macrophages. This type of hypersensitivity is cell-mediated and antibody-independent. It's the only type of hypersensitivity that we're talking about today that does not involve antibodies. The other three all have some interaction with antibody function. Examples include contact dermatitis following exposure to things like poison ivy or cheap nickel jewelry, the PPD skin test for tuberculosis, and multiple sclerosis or MS, which involves T cells tackling the myelin of neurons. One thing that's often confused is contact dermatitis with type 4 hypersensitivity and atopic allergic reactions, which are type 1 hypersensitivity. Both of these involve dermatologic problems as a result of hypersensitivity. However, they act via different mechanisms and happen following the exposure to different things, usually. The key to differentiate the two is the timeline. Atopic problems form within minutes of the exposure, while contact dermatitis takes days to form. There's also often a hint for contact dermatitis that points you towards poison ivy that the patient was recently in the woods a few days ago or something like that. That brings us to the end of this video. If you liked this video and you'd like to help me out, please do comment below. Just let me know what you're thinking what you like, what you don't like, any uh, suggestions for improvement, anything like that, it really would help me out. The next video in the inflammation and immunology section is going to cover transplant rejection. If you'd like to watch that video, you can click on this black box here, and I would suggest doing so because that video and this video have a lot of overlap and they correlate very well to each other, so it'd be good to cement some of the concepts we've discussed in this video with that video. So please do go ahead and click on that. Thank you so much for watching and good luck with the rest of your studying.